Hello everyone and welcome to Ace Update Interaction on Architecture Icons 2020. An iconic project is something that continues to remain in vogue till infinity. But it is the attention to details that sets it apart. Details like the adaptivity of the context in question, the design and the functionality of the interiors, not to mention the client needs and its infusion with the creative syntax of the architect and designer. Now this process has resulted in creation of iconic projects in the past, in the present, and it will continue to do so in the future as well. With this agenda in mind, today, the ACE Update webinar on Architecture Icons 2020 will try to look at these specific aspects of what makes a project iconic. We will touch upon some of the iconic projects which have become a paradigm in the realm of green and sustainable architecture as well. Ladies and gentlemen, without wasting any time, let me introduce to you our distinguished speakers for today's interaction. Today, we have with us Mr. Pankaj Gandhi, Director of VH Design Studio, Ahmedabad, we have Abhishek Chadda, CEO of the Cardigars, Bangalore. Ms. Shashi Rekha, Chief Architect, Space Studio, Chennai. So delegates, get ready to be enlightened. We'll begin with the adaptability of context in architecture. The adaptability of context in architecture is one of the key elements which adds a dose of uniqueness in a project and makes it exclusively. Today, to talk more about it, we have with us Mr. Pankaj Gandhi. Mr. Pankaj is the director of VH Design Studios. VH Design Studios is a multidisciplinary design firm headquartered in Ahmedabad, India. The accent at VH Design Studio is towards client sensitive designs in terms of identity, function, cost, and time. With a dedicated team of architects, along with engineers, designers, artisans, and related professionals, VH Design Studios has international standing across various spectrum of designs. So let's welcome Mr. Pankaj Gandhi. We are going to share on the adaptivity of the contextual architecture that we have the we have done the project in the Puj. It's called we call it a Desert Monk. A Desert Monk we uh, completed I think uh, two years back. It is called the Shurya Varsani Academy, and the, we we selected this project for this. Uh, uh, topic is called adaptivity of context in architecture. It's a, a very sensitive issue for us, uh, for the entire architecture fraternity, because uh, when we move around the, with the various places, when I was started my career and now, it's a drastic uh, change we see in the architects happening across the globe. Uh, we are very much concerned about the what we have and what we are losing right now. So. Uh, sometimes down the line, 50 years back, uh, 50 years down the line, what we see architecture, probably in Ahmedabad or Singapore and New York, probably we see the same architecture happening. So that's a matter of concern. So the context somebody is losing, the architecture is losing, and that's a matter of concern. And we try to uh, address those issues in this uh, our uh, project it's called Sudhya Varsani Academy. But let me just brief about the, uh, the whole project. It's a, an extreme part of the uh, uh, India. It's called in Bhuj. Uh, the desert is just 40 kilometers away, kilometers away from this uh, site. So it's completely a barren land we had. And uh, the client from Sesals wanted to have this school campus coming up. So the initial concern was how to address this whole issue because it's a very extremity of weather is there. Uh, the sun goes up to 47 degree temperatures in the summer and uh, 7 to 4 degree. You probably heard about the Nalia. Is Nalia is very nearby the Bhuj. It, it, today, you have a 4 degree temperature in Nalia. So that's the extremity we were facing. So that we designed this whole school campus in such a way that it addresses both entire environmental uh, aspects. And most importantly, the Bhuj, and now we talk about the adaptivity of contextual architecture. The Bhuj is a rich culture of the um, Raja Maharajas, the entire Saurashtra region. 
So we started this school's campus and the entry itself we depict the something a very gorgeous kind of uh, uh, entrance where the uh, horse buggy is going to uh, stand out there and Raja Mara is going to get down. So kind of things we wanted at the entrance part. So we started with the entry in such a way that the address is the uh, kind of uh, context. Secondly, the most important part about this uh, uh, architecture is about the heat gain and the dust storm. The dust storm is a big issue in the bush and is uh, uh, when the dust storm starts everything, you know, the wind velocity is approximately 70 to 120 kilometers of, uh, per, per hour. So that was the, to be uh, addressed. So we designed this uh, architecture in a very uh, cozy form. So nothing can harm the school campus, any, any intense, uh, intense weather in any time. So let me start with this. So <clears throat> architecture, we consider this kind of uh, uh, contextual parameters, which is the temperament of the community. We start with that because Bhuj is a something, uh, a, a community which fights a lot with their uh, uh, weather and also it's a very in a business, business community. So we designed the consideration of the business parameters. Architectural heritage, of, of, of course, we considered in this uh, uh, SSA project. History of the site, we know is a barren land. So we have to uh, keep the water conservation in the uh, in the mind. So we kept it that those things in the uh, criteria. Available to local middle, uh, the Bhuj is a rich culture of limestone. So we use the limestone in wherever it is, it was possible. And of course, the local weather was the already address uh, in the architecture. Let's just let me go through the uh, actual site peak. It is a desert monk we can call. And uh, you can see the narrow passages in between, which reduces the intensity of weather, which creates the shadow, and uh, it uh, reduces the effect of the, uh, the uh, storms. So this is that pl master planning. I mean, if you see the uh, image, you can see the master planning. North facing is the uh, terrain, uh, the big mountain out there. And the entire sports complex has been uh, uh, placed in the south west uh, southeast part and on the northeast part the entire hostel campus and school has been uh, placed the entire com campus has been cozily designed the narrow passages we have created and uh, the shadow is falling on the other buildings so to reduce the heat gain effect on the uh, other buildings so this is that entrance we were talking about the entrance main and the same entrance is falling for the auditorium building and the hostel building also. We have used the redstone, which is locally available in the booth, which is cladded on the uh, surfaces. Enter school building has been given the cavity wall and huge 10 feet passages to reduce the, uh, the heat gain. Secondly, that it reduce settle down the dust on the passages. So the classroom is not affected at all. Secondly, the most important aspect we have considered is we have given the corridor the both the sides so when somebody is writing the students is writing on the right uh, table you are not getting the shadow uh, of their own hand so that's the most important aspect we consider so we gave the light from the both the sides so uh, they never get the uh, shadow on their own writings this is most important these are all digitally and a very innovative classroom we have designed when you see the sports arena of the same the the swimming pool we have covered with the uh, prefab structures so we never get this uh, the dust on the uh, water so that's it they clean all the year around the sports arena also been closed but the uh, light has been uh, uh, consciously uh, achieved that we get the light from all the day and you never need to click on the artificial lights anytime we have created dancing rooms and all in the basement. So we get the cool effect on the basement. So we create a dancing, which is on the uh, right left of the uh, screen. On the left, you get the auditorium field. So these are the uh, structures, uh, glimpse of the structure and the window detailing we have created. Nisis has been created with the uh, ornamental uh, cornices, which is a, a part of the Saurashtra uh, uh, architecture. So it's not very too much ornamental, but you get the glimpse of ornamental things and very modern kind of auditorium we have placed. And this is the largest auditorium we have designed for the entire Kutch region. So even people of the Kutch can utilize this 
uh, from that perspective, we have designed this and client wanted that the general people also can utilize this uh, uh, class and the auditorium. So we have designed a large scale uh, auditorium. The capacity of this auditorium is 560 people. Uh, this is that classrooms we have designed on the right. You can see the light is coming from both these uh, windows and these are all uh, very digitally, very hi-fi classrooms we have designed. So this is a classroom design. The interior design of a project imparts a personality to it, personality to it. And in a world which is getting increasingly globalized, an iconic element, especially in residential projects, if I may say so, is also the way in which the interior reflects tradition as also modernism. To talk more about it, we have on our panel, Mr. Abhishek Chadda. Abhishek Chadda is the CEO and founder of the Karigars. From inception to execution, conceptualization to curation, this Bangalore-based firm undertakes complete turnkey projects for villas and apartments. The Kari Girls has revolutionized ordinary houses with their efficient layouts, uplifting color palettes, bespoke furniture, and strategic lighting schemes. So let's welcome Mr. Abhishek Chadda. So today I'm going to show you a project which was uh, executed very recently. So this is a, this is a villa which was three floor designed in Bangalore and the name of the project was uh, Prestige Lakeside Habitat. Very unique thing about the project was the client was in uh, Bermuda. He has stayed in Bermuda for 25 years and he was coming back to India. He was a very old Bangalorean style and then you will see the lot of things which we have tried to bring in from his old memories in the project as I walk you through the uh, project. So this is uh, spreading around across uh, 8,000 square feet uh, with a beautiful garden and uh, there's a lot of English style touch which you see uh, in, the, in the project, right? Which existing in 1930s, in the pre-independence era, right? From the stunning interiors and all the three floors which are blended very seamlessly with each other. And everything has got their own style. And as we enter the house, you can see this beautiful ceiling that we, that we designed. So it gives you a complete flamboyant ceiling which catches the attention of every person who enters the house. And we did play with a lot of mirrors and artifacts as soon as you enter. The foyer was designed very beautifully. The panels, the, I mean, it almost feels like you're guiding the guests to the living room. The whole hallway leads directly to the living room, which has got an instant feeling of expansiveness, comfort, and coziness. So the walls and everything, we kept it very neutral. You see, it's all beige color, very soft tone walls, everything. But we try to highlight all through chairs and through these pillows, right? And, the, the all, and this was all automated because of the double height ceiling, we automated the entire curtain and there was a lot of automation brought to this house. And as soon as you move from the living to the other area, the dining, the kitchen, puja, all were in the same place. So you can see we have done the puja here, a crockery here, and this is the entrance to the kitchen. Since it was visible, the utility part, we did a sliding door in the utility, which can just stop the view of whatever you have in the utility part of it. And we did a beautifully designed uh, traditional mandir here with a lot of shelves because they had a lot of, lot of statues and ideals to be placed here. And then that's the dining room. We, we did a beautiful lighting on top of it because lighting is our forte at Karigas because we always believe that less is more. You don't need to clutter the house through a lot of furniture and everything, but instead you play with lights, a splash of colors. Like so you see a lot of yellows played everywhere in the kitchen, right from the chair to the shutters, a tinge of yellow added to a lot of places in the kitchen as well. This was a first floor family, which is extremely cozy and is a sight to behold. The rustic bookshelf uh, designed in the shape of Tic Tacs, which is have an old time feel because the client, you always have to listen to the client. The client always wanted to have a old Bangalorean feel. They left 25 years ago. They said, Abhishek, when I come back, I really want to feel one room where I, I, I was just, so you see the kind of switches we have played that round black, black on and off button. This is a kind of lighting we did. This is a rope light which we played on the top. Even the world map, they love to travel a lot. So we did a custom rug with a world map here. These hand chairs, so we can just sit, relax, grab a book from here. So everything was very customized with us in this room. Yeah, and then since they came from Bermuda, New York, we did a complete custom wallpaper on a wall where they can connect to the place from where they have come back to India. And there is an art set lighting right from here. When you sit in the piano, this just illuminates the entire area. And then there's all the artifacts that they collected traveling all across the world. So we played everything up. In the whole family room, we played with a lot of their personal stuff. So it was almost connecting to the old memories, 
coming back to India, coming back from Bermuda, New York, and this room was completely. As soon as they enter, they get connected to the, the Indian soldiers. They had two daughters, and this is how we designed the complete room with a lot of spaces for the storage. We gave a place to climb up. They can just have fun here. And the storage, there were, there were plenty of storage. If you look at every single element, we get try to hide the storage behind this. There was just a drawer placed here. This acts as the partition as well as all the game boards, skateboards, everything can be kept here. So you have to design the house such that all the things goes inside. Then only you'll get a sense of luxury. Instead of adding clutter and other things, you can intelligently design a lot of storage spaces. Try to find the dead corners which is not used. Try to give storages there. That's how you should build up. But everything goes inside, and you get a sense of, sense of space of luxury. Yeah, this is a third floor, and that was an audio visual room that has a mood lighting on top, which is out completely automated. And then this, we played a bubble chair here. You can see the transparent acrylic bubble chair, and the yellow recliners again, a pop-up colors here and there. So we 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 try to play colors through here, and all the walls, if you see, are all soft tone. Again, that client wanted to loves riding bikes, so we, we add a lot of personal things here. You can see the artifact, the way we play with the bikes, the antique clock. So designing house, you always have to listen to the client what they want. That's how you will design every house, which will be very unique. As a brand, we try to we, you cannot just force your ideas on the client. You have to always listen to the client what they want, what they're coming from, and I can assure you, every house you design will be very different because every client, every youth is a different human being. They got their own perspective of how they want to see the house, and this is what we always try to bring in the table. I always tell my people, just listen to the client what they want. We should be able to achieve. Again, lighting is a hotel, like I told you. This was a chandelier which we gave, which is very geometric. And when you come down, you see this look of the chandelier, right from the circle of the rings, like this. I mean, these are some of the lighting plays that we have done right above the breakfast counter. If you see, it's all filament LEDs that we have used here. Again, lighting here, the arch shape light. So this is the dining table, and then we did a very contemporary lighting on top of the dining table here. So a lot of mix of cove lighting, the fall ceiling light, plus the chandeliers of the dining table. If you look at here, we play with a lot of mirrors so that it expands the whole view of the room because we believe that mirror. Really makes your house look very big, and that's why you see a lot of mirror played all across the place. You see a big mirror placed here in the dining the dining place here also. So always we believe that the, after the interiors are done, your house should feel much bigger than what you got it. And that's why we try to play with a lot of mirrors and a lot of stuff which you see here. So even the lightings are placed around the mirror here. Again, the color strategy what we try to always bring in is neutral. Because that's something very luxury. Always play with neutral colors on the wall, and just try to pop up with the occasionally, just occasionally try to pop up color. It just comes to your eyes. Like if you look at the chair, the yellow chair has got a blue cushion here. This blue chair has got a yellow cushion here. So it's all alternate in color playing. Then we had a subtle green with orange. Yeah, try to throw pillows in the upholstery of the couches and armchairs in the room that will really take it to the next level instead of playing red and green on the wall. Because this, you can change. The walls and the color scheme of the house, you cannot change once you design it. Again, kitchen, we try to stress a lot in, in the storage spaces. So if you look at this kitchen, it's got a lot of storages, very modern appliances, and it relies heavily on the gray colors with a hint of yellows. So we use those state of art automation technologies at Carrigos. Absolutely, is automated. Even after post-COVID things, a lot of things have changed. People want to. It's not Monday to Friday you are going to office. You are working from home. We have to make sure your working from home is very very comfortable. All the mesh routing, Wi-Fi connectivity, everything we have taken care. Again, the color strategy. If you talk about the headboard, again the mirrors, the wallpaper, the fabrics. They all together tie up. If you have to tie, just add a color, just add through a chair. If you look at the chair, the forest green armchair, it again adds a lot of pop-up color in the room, bringing light into it and allowing the resident to study, sit, relax, whatever they want to do. Oh, what is unique about this project? Yeah, from pin to piano, every element of this opulent home 
has been customized, including the wallpaper to first floor lighting. And uh, if you look at the, the space here, the pagoda accommodates the late night event. So we, we did a nice pagoda here with a koi fish, koi fish pond. In fact, when I spoke to the client two weeks ago, he was saying he's working from home from this place now. <laughs> he loves to work from home. I mean, this is so calm, serene, you know, just sitting near the koi pond because there was a waterfall, the sound of the water falling just makes it very, very serene and calm. So I missed the green grass. We did this cobblestones in the shape of footprints, which lead to the outdoor setting. And any gorgeous, gorgeous state deserves an outstanding water feature in the landscape design. So we try to play with a lot of water features, natural element. So natural element, yes, we are trying to play with a lot of natural element now. We're trying to play with a lot of greens, plants inside the room, indoor plant, outdoor plant. So our balcony, our gardening, this has also become too much. The product's values have become much higher post-COVID levels because people try to spend a lot of time in the balcony and the garden areas. Again, why this product is unique to us, the outdoor garden design in this bungalow will put to shame even the most luxurious hotel gardens. This space celebrates the nature and is decorated with flower and greenery. Again, the contemporary interiors which we did with all burst of Buddha sit on suspended deck, smart hook technology. Automation is the name of the game that has been taken to the next level for in the household. So we did a lot of automation here, plus the lighting fixtures, which I've already shown you. So we focus a lot on lightings, like I told you. And think luxury, think the carriers. Less is more. That's what we call luxury. You do less, the thing should look more. And you always believe that simplicity is sophistication. You keep the thing simple, that looks much sophisticated. Now we'll move on to a session on balancing opulence and functionality in workspaces. A project cannot be bankable on opulence and aesthetics alone. Functionality is also a key parameter. And if a project is to be deemed as iconic, it is necessary to find a proper balance. Be it residences, or office spaces. To speak more on the topic, we have with us Ms. Shashi Rekha. Ms. Shashi Rekha is the chief architect for Space Design Studio. She has worked on numerous projects to include a 100-room hotel for Taj Ginger Hall now in Chennai, a 440-bedded state-of-the-art super speciality hospital at Salden, a 190-acre township at Indore, and many more. Her design skills and eye for detail makes each project unique. Her vision and her inspiration for work are to create aesthetically appealing spaces without compromising on the functionality and the client needs. So that's us, uh, Space Studio Chennai. And uh, we have been dedicated uh, and we still are dedicated to uh, creating stylish spaces uh, since 2009. Uh, and uh, it, it's interesting to look at uh, op opulence and functionality in workspaces. Uh, I'm going to be presenting an uh, office project which is close to my heart. And uh, it probably towards the uh, end of the presentation, maybe take you through one, uh, every bit of information on on another project that that would probably be a, a slide or two. Um, so that's it. This is uh, I'm, I'm going to present Dura Pack, which is a packaging company uh, which caters to international clients and and a lot of Indian clients as well. And uh, this is in Porur, Chennai. Uh, this is about us. Um, we are, we are an award-winning architectural firm. We are based at Chennai with the project Span India and abroad. We have worked with a builder in Texas and there's one that we have done in Riyadh. Uh, and uh, essentially what we do at the studio is to uh, strive really hard to enhance the way we experience spaces. And uh, naturally that becomes our mission to make our built environment way more uh, meaningful and beautiful. Uh, it, it's it's mainly because it, it hurts me to see badly designed buildings. So uh, that's where the focus on beauty comes from. 
and meaningful because functionality is important. So that kind of becomes the balancing factor here between opulence and functionality. What you see on the screen here is an iteration we had done for a corporate office, uh, but that's just a backdrop mostly for today. These are some of the recognitions. Uh, I would just mention one or two. I think 2020, uh, the project that I'm presenting now has won uh, best project architectural category on a workplace excellence award, which is an organic award um, as voted by the C-suit members of the top corporates in Chennai and a uh, few others which you can perhaps read through. It's uh, mostly to do with workplaces. We are into corporate real estate a lot. We like, we enjoy working with corporates. Uh, and then we are also into sustainable design and, and I do care about infrastructure. We are architects for uh, Mumbai Metro, some of the ancillary buildings and few other key infrastructure projects. So that's it now. I, I'm taking you through DuraPAC. Uh, this is the MD's uh, cabin there, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is subtle. Uh, I, I might want to repeat what uh, Abhishek just mentioned as that simplicity as the ultimate sophistication. That's the idea here. We have kept it simple in terms of uh, color choices. We've kept it muted, almost monochrome. Uh, so uh, uh, we were specific about not having color accents because it's an office building. And uh, the panel that you see uh, here is custom designed and uh, it's plain with a bit of sheen from a silver uh, finished paint. And, and there are also these uh, sturdy, beautiful lines that you see, which are uh, stainless steel uh, strips cut to shape. And, uh, and this kind of repeats on the uh, ceiling as well. And uh, this infinity light that you see on top is one of our personal favorites. I, I think I went with the clients and shop for it. Um, and the desking system is from Fresa. We, we got it done from Italy and the uh, chairs, I think probably from Mumbai, yes. Uh, that's on the managing director's cabin. And uh, so this is the view from the cabin and into the conference room, uh, which was kind of important. Uh, and this, this glass, the level of transparency can be adjusted. So that's a bit of automation that we uh, got into and uh, lighting we we went for warm white which which we feel is good for focus uh, because you're uh, more of neutral in fact because warm whites work better for retail and and whites for uh, functional spaces but neutral is, is one shade which kind of helps uh, balance uh, between the two so uh, that's a personal favorite and uh, the, the door that you see here is again, uh, more of a Zen theme, it's, it's custom designed. And um, this is the conference room. Uh, we, uh, we had a challenge, which we kind of turned it into an opportunity for us. Um, this was in an industrial packaging company. Uh, uh, that said, it, it's however a luxurious office that they wanted. Uh, to present to their international clients. But it so happened that the, uh, uh, as you stand facing the building, the right side was, uh, there was not much of a lighting opportunity. So we were wondering um, how can we bring in that sense of light? But, but conferences, as you know, do not require natural light. So that was one of the reasons we put the conference room there, the lift there, the storage rooms there, essentially spaces that um, do not rely heavily on natural lighting. So uh, to sense, uh, uh, to create a sense of light, we created these beautiful uh, cut panels uh, and uh, with, with subtle lights coming in from the side. So it's not frosted, it's, it's actually a niche, um, it would cut to that shape. And, and then we somehow lucky for us found a, a wallpaper which matches it with uh, golden uh, stripes, which brings in a sense of luxury. I also feel the chairs are interesting here and, and uh, like how they say the carpet should match the curtain. Typically that's what we have done here. The carpets on the back of the chair kind of happen to match. Uh, I, I might say it quite easily, but I think we would have stepped into some 20, 30 spaces to kind of shortlist those. So it looks easy. That's one thing about creating uh, minimal luxury. It, it, it's made to look easy, but it's quite difficult to create 
in terms of time and uh, so and 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 this this other light here with a slight wave is to just balance the sense of uh, the straight lines everywhere else in the office these are some of the workspaces uh, this is a custom design storage that we created um, again the the designer sense uh, has been brought in by playing with gradation uh, even the pin up the fabric that you see was uh, um, selected with uh, some effort so, and and the colors are minimal I, I, we uh, this is the reception which uh, possibly I should have shown first but uh, we believe to be uh, to receive people well is to be perceived well it, it, the reception was all about the brand uh, and uh, so we 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 kept it with uh, very less furnishing and and more of a sense of space and uh, uh, the the opulence mostly comes from light accents um, uh, like abhishek said we we are also interested in playing with light quite a bit uh, because we feel it makes a huge difference to a project and uh, the, the design they say is always in the detail and there's so much detail that you can bring through lighting um, and uh, the hanging uh, shades there are again minimal but, but we believe it's beautiful the desk is custom designed uh, to kind of match with the pattern that you saw elsewhere the chamfered uh, um, lines uh, that flow across and uh, uh, this is a prayer niche that I'm not sure if you can possibly see uh, that you, so the reception kind of opens into this prayer niche and uh, this is the uh, niche for prayers. And uh, this is a private lounge that we created adjoining the MD cabin. Uh, there's an interesting story that client likes to travel and uh, uh, they were interested uh, specifically in Paris. So we got the wallpaper uh, that kind of captures the Notre Dame, the uh, Eiffel Tower and some of the key features. Uh, we, we do not exactly believe in placing wallpaper on, on the walls. We, we like to kind of play around. So this kind of starts from a wall. I'm afraid I may not have a picture, but it's the wall opposite to this uh, TV television cabinet there. It starts from the wall and runs into the ceiling. So it, it gives a sense of continuity to the whole space. And there's an interesting story about the, um, the paint that you see here. It's, it's emerald green. It's, it's, it's got a sheen to it. It, it uh, um, not only speaks luxury. For me, I think emerald green screams luxury, especially when it has a um, that glow and sheen to it. So we worked with uh, Asian paints and uh, uh, the uh, we, and the other paint company, uh, Dulex, uh, to create, we, we must have created almost uh, 20 to 50 different shades. I mean, I, I'm, I'm giving you a not so logical range here, but, but as far as I remember, for a whole week, we were only looking at paint shade cards, one, one uh, 12 inches by 12 inch cards. And then someone came and kind of tried to help us get that uh, paint paint because it's, it's, even better than wallpaper and, and we finally got that shade which we are happy about and and then this artwork just happened which kind of merges both the wallpaper and the uh, shade of the paint it has got all the colors in it um, so it just fell in place uh, when we walked into a gallery to pick an art piece we saw this and then we said yes this is what we're going in for and there's also a nautical lamp there to add an element of interest and a lot of lacquered glass Yes, and, and uh, this is a restroom adjoining the MD cabin, and that, that's probably when Kohler had uh, come up with the black range. So we used it and we went uh, black and gold for the project, and, and, and the ceiling has a stardust uh, kind of effect because uh, we used a textured board, a very, very simple board, and then we just painted it gold. Uh, so these are the ideas that kind of we didn't plan it before, but sometimes as you build a project, some ideas evolve and that makes it all the more beautiful. Uh, so we like to believe. And, uh, this is the exterior. Uh, th this is how we took the project, uh, took over. Then uh, it kind of grew to, uh, we, we iterated on various designs and then exterior again, lighting speaks for itself. And uh, uh, 
uh, we we are specific about putting in. So this is a project we built um, with the uh, from the interiors to the civil work and architecture and interior. Um, and we also believe in creating green corridors in whatever little way we got. That there was space restriction, not to say no. But then I think we tried to work in a small green corridor, artificial glass, but we are still happy about it. So that's mostly on the uh, on the Tura pack, the packaging office. Um, after we completed the project, uh, the client didn't tell us initially, but we kind of realized it was very close to the client's heart because uh, it's an young couple. He was uh, he was a very shrewd and smart businessman. Uh, he travels a lot, but for him it was important in some way to impress his father. Uh, which we were not even, I mean, had we known, we could have charged him more, but uh, he didn't know it back then. <laughs> so later, uh, at the time of Puja, in fact, I had gotten him the Ganesha that I had shown as a gift. And then that's when he told me, Sashi, this project is very close to my heart because uh, my dad, uh, it's a sense of pride for me. And, and they were very, very happy. Because uh, I, I believe for sons, it's difficult to impress fathers. I mean, we daughters don't have a problem with it. <laughs> so, and I'm going to take you through the form finding process for another, but I'm not sure if I have overshot time here, but I think two minutes. Uh, so the form finding process, usually what it can get a bit difficult. Sometimes it just falls in place. And um, sometimes it can be extremely difficult to uh, kind of... Uh, uh, get the form in place. So it, it's, uh, I'm not sure if you should call it luck or if you should call it coincidence or, or a chance. Uh, th there are projects where at the first instance, you create what you really want to create, but you don't stop there. You, you keep going back. And then there are instances where you keep working, you keep working at something that is in your hand. And then you, it, something just don't, just does not fall in place. And then out of the blue, you create something or some input comes in from the client. So it's it's more like co-designing uh, along with all the stakeholders uh, that that actually helps in arriving at the right form for a project. So this is um, actually a, a very small sample of what we went through. I mean, this is one project, um, mind you. And uh, th these are all the um, uh, various iterations that we went through for the project. It's a corporate office for a shipping building. But, uh, uh, somehow we weren't thinking, we, we didn't get a sense of uh, here's where we wanted to go. Uh, that sometimes what happens in, 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 in instances like this is what we create becomes suitable for something else. So the image that you see on the left, uh, it, it was kind of interesting for a warehouse project. So it, it was not a wasted effort. We did end up using the idea. Uh, but this is a process which we have to anyway go through to to uh, if you have to really create uh, something timeless, something that stands out, something that uh, that is more meaningful, more beautiful. Uh, that, that's the hard work. That's the part about architecture which most people do not understand. Um, we uh, we do not just do what it is that you see our built. We we go back and iterate a lot on the design process. And, and then we get some ideas here and there, like, like for instance, this, uh, this canopy that you see here is, is something that we reused and then the, the, the wave pattern that you see. So, and, and essentially this is what we created in the end. Um, the, the, this is the shipping office. So the, the idea of a luxury yacht appealed to us. So we created uh, uh, the building in the shape of a luxury yacht and, and, and it goes for the interiors as well. So this is an upcoming project and um, it's, it's going to be mostly a sustainable building where close to about 60% uh, of the electrical requirement is going to come from the sustainable ideas that we will be implementing. Nilesh will today talk on opulence and luxury have become keywords in architecture and design, but an introspection is needed as to how it can be achieved across different projects, right from the residential and commercial spaces to office and retail spaces. We also need to understand the perceptional intent of these terms. For example, in a city like Mumbai, space itself is a luxury. Perhaps a more precise example will be the Japanese concept of minimalism, which emerged after a period of excesses, a concept which is now being actively practiced by architects 
and de designers across the globe. Yet another challenge is also how to be sus sustainable as also luxurious. Now I invite our respected speakers, Mr. Pankaj Gandhi, Mr. Abhishek Chadda, Ms. Shashi Rekha to join me. So let's begin with Mr. Pankaj. Mr. Pankaj, I would like to uh, ask you, like, is the idea of opulence and timelessness same across different geographical boundaries? Now, given the fact we have different schools of architecture and design to begin with, how easy is it to come to a uniform conclusion? See, we need to address this issue holistically. When you talk about kind of a, a concluded uh, topic, we need to look at the socio-economy and the cultural aspect of the individual community. When you talk about, especially when you talk about the Indian context, I think it is very, uh, not that easy, but rather little easy to uh, communicate those things into the architecture because our heritage, our culture is in a such a, uh, evolved in a such a fashion that we always believe in uh, utilizing the minimum. So that same thing, culture has a reflection on the architecture. When you see any sort of architecture, let me quote one example. When you talk about Gandhi, Gandhi ji, and the, the structures evolved in that era, when you talk about the Sabarmati Ashram or Kochra Ashram in Ahmedabad, is an iconic win in terms of the timelessness, in the simplicity, in the minimalistic aspects. So those are relevant with the, our culture. And when we stop getting influence from the Western uh, materials and Western ideologies, I think and when we stick to our original uh, platforms, would be able to address this issue very cleanly, neatly, and would be able to serve the community in a better form. So I would uh, say that it's a, every, every, every community, every uh, society has its own perception and when you talk about when you talk about the paris suppose when you talk about the europe <clears throat> the paris evolution and the countryside architecture of the paris it's a completely drastic difference out there so when you stick to the original uh, uh, society formation and their culture i think the timelessness would be we can address it very neatly in any any region i think but in Indian context, it is something I would say it's a little easy to address those issues. Timelessness is something for, especially for India as a country, that we have established uh, uh, much ahead of many of the other uh, nations, I would say. Uh, because if you see, we have uh, temples that are a thousand year old that are standing, uh, still standing. And then um, if you take uh, the Tanjore Temple, for instance, the, the structural engineers of today have still not figured out um how the uh, the structural system has been done and there are extensive carvings which uh, talks to the opulent side of it so uh, that's the whole beauty uh, it uh, while it some of the things might look minimal um, it, there's a lot of work that goes in the, the idea that and i feel that that's mostly what it makes it timeless uh, when there are a lot of details added to it but it made to look very minimal and simple and um, we uh, as a culture as a nation I'm, I'm in fact very glad that we are doing this while we are doing uh, we are experimenting on uh, or discussing on on the uh, uh, subject as we are um, we feel india as a country uh, we've kind of lost that touch of magic in terms of architecture uh, what we were we were ahead of the rest of the world uh, the kind of marvels that we have created uh, but of late, if you see, there are some of the smaller countries like Scandinavia and Danish nations, Denmark, who are uh, much more, uh, not to compare, but uh, uh, there are more intelligent projects coming out, that more beautiful, more uh, um, worldwide noticed projects that are coming out. So, so I feel um, Chennai especially, or a South market, and India as a nation, except given maybe Delhi and Mumbai, um, where for people it's important to you know show their wealth and uh, the rest of them are too muted and I feel that makes it more challenging to create timeless projects. So almost every building that we create now is like every other building. Um, almost all the residences are matchboxed structures. Almost all the offices are the straight glass structures. 
there are a few heartwarming, interesting projects which do come in, um, which is a solace to my heart. And, and so I feel that's, that's a focus, that's an awareness of architecture, awareness of respecting the profession, respecting the idea and understanding the, the value it takes because most people do not even understand why we pay what we pay to an architect and why it's important to invest in a project to create something that lasts longer. Um, so uh, to create something very beautiful, opulent need not necessarily mean more expensive. Um, at times it could actually be optimized. So that's the, my take on it. It could pay you back. What we pride ourselves in, like if you ask me, I feel um, and, and, uh, uh, 3D visual or, or the aesthetic of a building is what you look at, wherein a flow plan is what you live in. Uh, so uh, the, what we actually experience, which, which is it's got to do with what I, I all, earlier spoke about striving to enhance the way we experience spaces. We experience flow plans. We do not experience building exteriors except visually. And uh, which is why we, uh, I firmly believe aesthetics is a very uh, important uh, but a limited uh, part of architecture. It's huge in terms of infrastructure, in terms of understanding the various allied services, in terms of understanding or extending, stretching what a building could do. Like you could do a building that not only sustains but can pay back as well. Uh, like that, that can give power to a grid. You can you can do a building where the carbon monoxide level, an office where the carbon monoxide level is uh, is so beautifully managed that the occupants actually work better. So these are all various ideas. That, that's a shift that we create. We we I am hoping for, and and we need to look towards. Um, the aesthetics is important, but certainly not everything, uh, Prasad. That that's what I would say. Yes. I would like to add to Sashi. Uh... Design a look that is functional. That's what we believe in. Yes. Always design a look that is very functional because functionality exactly. is something that will always be there. You can design anything which is non-functional. It is not going to stay for a long time. Exactly. Always... Uh, now, the thing is, um, like you said, we uh, interestingly, till date, we, we have never really uh, been much into cladding or adding an element of design just to add beauty to a building. Uh, what we do is to look at the whole building envelope as a mass. Um, and the design is built in, like for instance, there are a, a continuously running sunshade or, or some lovely feature which, which reduces the impact of sunlight to the building, a screen which is laser cut pattern. So the impact of sunlight on that particular direction is reduced by 40, 50%. So every single aspect of a building envelope can actually be functional. It is possible and, and it can pay you back. And, and that is where uh, that's probably uh, why I kind of got excited when he mentioned it. Yes, the, the design is more to do. It's possible to do very functional design and not to design just to make it look beautiful because that could be work with sculptures and artworks. But we are talking architecture here, which is a balance between art and engineering. Luxury, opulence, timelessness. I think it matters much more. So in interiors, Abhishek, what according to you are the factors at play? in making a project opulent and timeless, then how easy or difficult is it to, you know, kind of listen to the client brief, gratify him, and also make the project timeless and opulent? Every project is different. Every single project we do, every, people ask me, you, you, say you do so many projects, how do you make sure that every project is different? And I always tell my clients, we never make sure projects are different. My clients make sure that their project is different. Once you listen to the client, note, take a notebook, take a paper, understand his needs, understand what he's trying to visualize in his home. Because he's a different human being. Every single client whom I meet has got a different perspective out of his home, how he feels. Everybody tells me, Abhishek, I want a very clean look, very subtle, minimalistic, but I want a lot of storage. Now, how to achieve that storage? That's when you come in as a designer and then you add, okay, these are the intelligent kind of sort of intelligent spaces that you need to add there. And this is all you should do. So basically, for me, there are five greatest tips that I, I always follow. One is simplicity in the form and functions. You should always, always, we always believe simplicity in the form and functions are always very useful. Don't try to overcomplicate the things. Keep it simple, neat, it will always work. Like Shashi said, I always be, I call that word for uncomplicated cladding. You don't need to use complicated claddings and everything. You, you can just make it uncomplicated. Just use the wall finishes, which are very uncomplicated. You don't need to complicate things with a lot of flower decorations and everything which you have been seeing from ages. So you can just keep it very subtle, abstract, 
it will always work it will always always work and uh, light air never try to cut down that a lot of people try to close the windows and i don't know i but i never close down lights air natural element this should always you should always make your home feel very airy very lighted up if there is less light in some of the rooms due to the pulsing uh, panels but should be very airy and lighted up that's what i believe in and then you ask me yeah the strategic use of the materials what do you use so a lot of indoor plants right the artifacts the mirrors the wall painting that you use these all will really bring it your home to a next level it's not about your wardrobes and kitchen it's never about the wardrobes and kitchen it's all about you the artifacts and the way you play around which brings the identity of yourself in your inside your home do a family picture wall right and that 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 can have frames where you travel all across the world right from a kid was born just have all the memories from the kid so these are the things which we always play with the spatial needs of any given space it may be a especially in you know mass consumption properties or commercial properties the spatial needs get altered over time today it may be a office for a lawyer tomorrow it may be an office for someone else so like in such cases you know like in such properties do you believe timelessness is actually possible or do you feel minimalism you know that concept is a safe bet in contemporary art see the uh, i just uh, now listening to both of these speakers uh, what we normally practice and what we realize in uh, span of our uh, consulting uh, see the when you play with the basics of space the formulations and a basics of material and allow that material to speak in itself i just quote one example uh, just you when you just think about the sept in amdavad and just take out the exposed brick out of it and just think about the structure there that exposed brick it in itself is a glamour aesthetic we say minimalism we say and the timeless we can say so this all fundamental principles has been addressed via single use of material there is no cladding at all okay uh, when you just visit our a uh, co is designed by us the center of excellence where we use the plain plaster and the expose rcc inside the atrium the single material is speaking its own language and that is what we call it a timelessness today you go out there quota stone the flooring is there something which is a uh, has a history since last 40 50 years what you see today and what you see after 20 years you is look at the same material which is no alteration at all and there is a relativity between this era when you using those materials okay in some of the cases right now we are using the adobe which is something a very relevance with the brick because now is a green is the uh, concern green building is a matter of uh, environment concern so we have started using uh, instead of the burnt brick we are starting with the adobe so i always believe that the essence of the material using in a proper formation with a volumetric uh, size i think that speaks the timelessness and when you make the building with kind of material having those languages at the place when you use it for the lawyer's office or use it for the a uh, studio whether you use it for the ex purposes i think that will serve the purpose and that philosophical drive be, uh, behind that building actually make it a, a nice building or a timeless building see the formations the utility can be extreme if it is a extreme thing like if you talk about the a restaurant kitchen in that same building that has to be something a different one but the restaurant or a lawyer's office or a studio can be incorporated with the same concept of the timelessness and that's a philosophical drive is behind the a timeless building right nobody can uh, alter that and there are number of examples in amda we can you see the same building having the different functionality but the that building uh, you can say it's a timeless don't you think whatever the materials are used over a period of decades there is an evolving pattern of use of material so how does it impact the timelessness of you know uh, such architecture structures very true it is impacted uh, uh, not to say negative part but uh, that influence the fraternity 
uh, and the, always there's a client fences uh, always works in the kind of project and they want to use a kind of uh, material which is a, a looks gloomy uh, looks very glamorous but never suits and never suit the philosophy of the timeless material um timeless building rather so uh, we normally avoid using kind of material and which are a temporary life of maybe 5 years maybe 10 years maybe 15 years and which is not the life of a structure so you keep on changing the stuff you maintaining the building over a period of time and you losing the beauty of the building so this is what is happening since last couple of years in life last 25 30 years era so i we always put the emphasis on the basics of the material and uh, not putting anything and see when you design something which is nice you need not to hide it or need not to clad anything by any external material that design itself speaks and that volume itself speaks so when you stick to the basics of material i think that works like anything right and if you talk about the uh, high rises somebody may argue that if you what the what you can do about the high rises there is a cladding material is required the facades are required have we done some seven story a 14 story high rises in andhra also we never done any cladding the uh, external cladding we create the cavity walls we could, we gone for the exposed uh, uh, brick uh, cavity walls and the only windows are all of volume uh, of aluminum and the volume uh, volume has been set in such a way that they need not to change anything in the entire life span of the building and that is what the timelessness is you when you envelop anything externally right to make the uh, building beautiful i think that is where you lose the the core of architecture like when you see atma in amdabad the designed the cobbies when you see any dam structure designed by a reno architect you need not to clad anything on that part that itself is a timelessness the basics of material the envelope itself speaks when you design it in a uh, full form that that's it nothing to add nothing to paint nothing to you no know, Uh, do on the surfaces or inside or outside innovation and technology i always believe interiors is technology as i as a ceo i always thought uh, it's not about kitchen water what a carpenter makes so everything today at carios is is all technology driven everything is software driven with us right from higher softwares and if you look at my instagram the way we have done post covid things is, is uh, handles the underscore carios is absolutely another level we have taken post covid so things have changed we are we are not in the same age what was there in 2019 2020 is very different and and then our timeline so we don't want to spend a lot of time with the un, un, uneducated labor class doing the interiors for four months in a three bedroom house we want to finish it off 45 days just go install come out that's what we believe that's why we have invested so much on technology post covid because before we never had that demand but today if you don't invest in technology we can't be doing the same thing of four months five months people are so scared to All the carpenters did for any repair. So our quality has improved. Our timelines have reduced. Everything has changed. So we are in a different era. We have to understand that technology is something you can't avoid. Everything is technology today with us. When it comes to innovation in building materials and the use of technology in architecture and design, what kind of evolution have you, you know, witnessed? Well, see, uh, there are two ways to look at it. Uh, if you ask me to find the, uh, I, I would say both are required. and what would be important would be to find the right balance between the two like for instance personally for me if i use a table draw it has to have a soft close channel um which we didn't have few years back um but at the same time if you look back for uh, multi storied structures now bamboo is coming back into uh, bamboo is again a timeless material and, and like mr pankaj said i i kind of uh, love bricks so if you look at some of peter zumda's building there's no cladding it's it's just that a simple brick there, there was one building uh, where they have created a brick which is about uh, um, 30 inches by uh, 9 inches or you know we don't have to go by the norm but how do you create it you use technology uh, so technology helps in terms of scalability in terms of uh, managing the time uh, in terms of reducing the time of the project like there is this project which we did in riyadh where uh, not just the walls it's prefab uh, taking prefab on a different level it's it's not 3d printing exactly but um, we are manufacturing the whole floor of a building it's a 
500, uh, 300 square meter uh, building where we are uh, um, manufacturing the whole floor of a building elsewhere and then bringing it and assembling at site. So the site work is only 15 days. Um, how do you find the balance I feel would be key uh, between the two, but, but both are necessary. Uh, personally, for me, I would say 40, 60, 60% uh, I tend to go towards innovation because innovation is again what has enabled lighting. Innovation is what has enabled faster construction, faster brick laying. So times are changing. Um, so to keep the innovation intact and to never forget the roots and use technology to uh, kind of bring back the earlier elements, if it's helpful to us. Um, would would be interesting for me, yes. So there's a question from Ms. Tripathi uh, to all the panelists. What kind of green and eco-friendly materials and paints do you suggest for pro different projects? Eco-friendly materials, green materials, yeah. If you talk about lightings, there's no halogen anymore. It's all LED, ambient lighting, a lot of indoor plants. Paints, yes, there are a lot of paints from Asian paint, which comes now, which are, which are absolutely chemical free and you can see the ads in the Asian print. That's what we are doing. So I think everybody is shifted to the eco-friendly. Everybody wants a lot of green in their house. So there's plenty of options available right now in the market. Everybody's going organic. Food is organic, milk is organic, everything is organic. So interiors has also become very organic now. There are plenty of options available. So what kind of impact does it have on the cost of the project? Uh, I would if you compare, Maybe 20 percent more, yeah. These are 20 percent higher than what we do. But painting itself is not an eco friendly product. Uh, when you are talking on that subject, it's a very uh, wide one, but uh, let me just uh, have some on views on my views on that. Uh, if somebody is looking for eco friendly things and eco friendly uh, residences or interior or kind of thing, I think one should look from the grassroots level. When you're talking about kind of stuff, you can go for the lime plaster. You can have some additives of the vegetation and you can have the uh, lime plaster with the natural colors. So which is eco-friendly one. So paint are not eco-friendly. It's a just a marketing gimmicks or videos and all. Then these are all stuff. This is, we, I don't agree on that part, but if somebody is actually looking for a genuine one, this is something we can go for a, a lime or lime plaster or something like that. Oh, okay, of course, the mud plaster is there. But will it be suitable for all kind of projects, Ms. Mr. Pankaj? Yeah, of course. Lime is suitable for all kind of projects. Not the mud one, but the mm -hmm. lime is suitable for all sort of projects, exterior or interior. Actually, when you when you talk about kind of material, uh, Vikash uh, Prashad, it's absolutely industry driven. When you talk about the cement, it is extracted from the or made from the lime. And the entire channel works to make the cement. I make I dra I take out the lime. I make it a clinker. I just add some some gypsum and all, and I make the cement. And there's a channel of distribution. I get the cement at my site, and where I can get the lime from a local vendor. Immediately, I can make my walls. I can do the plaster. So, which is the simplest way? This is what we forgot in last forty years. To make something very speedy, we just switch over to the cement. It's, I'm not talking about you just replace everything with the lime, but when the, the two-story building is there, there is no time frame is fixed or no how to complete that project within three or four months. We can measure up our projects are two-story across the, when you talk about the infrastructure and the development in the country, the, the, the structures we have is a G plus one. And if you can replace with the lime, it is possible. We, just, we have been doing this last years and years. This last 50 years, we just replaced with the cement. And that is the most eco-friendly metal we can have and most sturdy metal we can have in the uh, present era. Uh, cement loses the strength by time. Lime gets the strength by time. Okay. After 50 years, the concrete is a, this debris. Lime is a rock. And that's the difference. So community and that entire community has to convey to this uh, to the, uh, the the clientele and we have to do a kind of campaign to have those materials on the platform. But there is a question. Uh, uh, how do you see the willingness to pay for designs by developers in India and how far Indian designers are producing original and localized designs? Do you have any examples? What incidentally happens as much as builders do advertise uh, 
that they do the best for the homes and it's luxurious and um, not all. Uh, I, I, I can't exactly estrange builders from my line of work, but uh, uh, typically in Indian market, they go with the L1. Uh, that's the structure in which a contract or a design is awarded. So the lowest coating architect or the lowest coating contractor kind of gets the project. I don't blame the builders completely here. So the, uh, but thankfully for us, there are a few builders who like to, uh, I cannot name anybody here, uh, but there are a few, which I'm sure when the buyers do their due diligence can identify as well, um, who are willing to get the right architects on board. So, so there is a sense of responsibility from the buyer's side here. Now, when you buy a home, you kind of go and look at various options or office space or something. Who do you consult? Uh, do you at all consult anybody? Do you consult a professional? So th that's something which I would recommend that you that you can do consult a professional uh, in, while at the time of buying and, and always even try to understand who is the architect. Um, but there is time for it. I think we are too early in terms of evolution. And so um, most projects only gets awarded to whoever quotes in lower digits. Then. Thank you, panelists, for exchanging your valuable thoughts on today's topic. Architecture Icons 2020. Delegates, we hope you enjoyed it. Before wrapping up today's session, we would like to thank our distinguished panelists, Mr. Pankaj Gandhi, Mr. Abhishek Chadda, and Ms. Shashi Rekha. I would also like to thank my editor, Mr. Prasad Naya, for taking this initiative. Thanks to all the delegates and viewers. So with this, we would like to announce the closing of today's session. Request you to stay tuned for more such sessions. Thank you and goodbye.